Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video and the next couple of videos, we're going to be talking about cholesterol transport through the body. And really, we're going to look at other lipids as well, such as triglycerides. However, the major thing we're going to be looking at is cholesterol. And the transport of cholesterol and other lipids differs from that of amino acids and sugars and things like that because sugars and amino acids are hydrophilic molecules. They're polar and or charged. And so they are soluble in the blood, and so they can very easily be moved in the blood due to their solubility. In contrast, lipids, for example, triglycerides and cholesterol, are insoluble. They're hydrophobic molecules, and so they require special handling. And this special handling is accomplished through lipoproteins, which are very, very large uh, macromolecules. So first, let's take a look at an example lipoprotein. So this is a lipoprotein schematic right here. It's a very large macromolecular structure, and its purpose is to transport lipids in the blood. Now, the blood is mostly composed of water. So if you wanted to make lipids soluble in water, you'd basically have to surround them with something that's polar. And in fact, in this diagram right here, all these yellow things and actually these blue things right here, these are all polar molecules, or at least the polar parts of molecules. So that means if the exterior of the lipoprotein is composed of a bunch of polar moieties, this whole thing will be soluble in the blood, and therefore you can transport it. Now, the interior is where all the lipids are. So all these in here, this is probably composed of triglycerides, composed of cholesterol, and so on and so forth. And the way that you get all of this inside the lipoprotein is that all of these structures right here, these yellow uh, molecules right here, have a special feature, and it's that they're amphipathic. That means that, in layman's terms, about half the molecule is polar, the other half is nonpolar or hydrophobic. So these amphipathic molecules strategically have their polar parts faced outward into the blood, that allows this whole thing to be soluble, but their hydrophobic part is actually facing the lipids inside. If we actually blow this up a little bit more and take a, a zoom in, here's an amphipathic molecule right here. This is actually a phospholipid. What we see here is the polar head is facing the exterior, therefore it interacts with water. However, these hydrophobic tails, remember phospholipids have tails, those are hydrophobic and therefore interact favorably with these lipids on the interior of the lipoprotein. And that allows this entire thing to be transported in the blood. And all four of these lipoproteins are gonna follow this pattern. So let's start at the beginning. From the diet, we get fat. So for example, triglycerides and fatty acids and cholesterol. And of course, those are gonna navigate through the GI tract and eventually in the intestine, uh, particularly the jejunum of the intestine, they're gonna be absorbed. Okay. And when these fats and cholesterol are absorbed, they're going to enter cells called enterocytes. And these enterocytes are going to package them into chylomicrons. A chylomicron is basically just a lipoprotein, but it's going to function a little bit differently than the others. Okay. Generally, the cholesterol that we see in chylomicrons is esterified, so they're termed cholesterol esters. And when we see this CE, that's actually what that stands for, cholesterol ester. And the fat has been re-esterified into the form of triglycerides. So it generally doesn't transport straight fatty acids. They'll be re-esterified in those enterocytes into triglycerides and then packaged into those chylomicrons. And those chylomicrons will eventually enter the blood, and I have an entire video where we go over how that occurs. And basically what the chylomicrons do is they do an initial sweep through the whole body, and they just deliver a bunch of free fatty acids to a bunch of peripheral tissues. So good examples of peripheral tissues are adipose tissue because they actually store fatty acids in the form of triglycerides, and then also skeletal muscle, which can actually utilize free fatty acids for energy. So if we look at the, the composition of these chylomicrons, what we see is actually that by percent, the vast majority of them is composed of triglycerides. This TAG actually stands for triacylglycerol, which is the same thing as a triglyceride. And actually a very low percentage of it is actually cholesterol. So 1% is just free cholesterol. The other 3% of that 4 are cholesterol esters. 
but the vast majority of the composition of the chylomicrons is triglycerides. So therefore, whenever these chylomicrons encounter a cell or a tissue type that requires free fatty acids, the cell activates a protein called lipoprotein lipase. Lipoprotein lipase is actually a part of the chylomicron, but it will only become activated when it encounters a cell that needs the free fatty acids. So being a lipase, what this enzyme does is it hydrolyzes off free fatty acids from the triglycerides that are present in the chylomicron. Remember, the chylomicron is mostly triglycerides. So if this chylomicron comes in contact with a cell, like a skeletal muscle cell, that might want free fatty acids, this cell will activate this enzyme and it will hydrolyze free fatty acids off of the triglyceride. Therefore, the free fatty acids can then make their way to that cell and that cell can utilize it for energy or in the case of adipose tissue, generally those free fatty acids are stored, which is a process called lipogenesis. Okay? Now, once a bunch of these triglycerides have been removed from the chylomicron because they've been hydrolyzed, you're left with something called a chylomicron remnant. Now that chylomicron remnant will make its way eventually back to the liver. Okay? Now the liver has receptors in its cell membrane called remnant receptors. So these chylomicron remnants are really just remnants because they're, a lot of their triglycerides have been removed due to lipoprotein lipase and delivery of free fatty acids. So when they get back to the liver, they interact with remnant receptors and they're basically just endocytosed. Okay? And the liver will then take whatever's left and repackage it into a different lipoprotein. In other words, the chylomicron remnants are gonna to return to the liver, be endocytose, and whatever's left from those chylomicron remnants are gonna be repackaged into a new lipoprotein, which we're gonna see is called a VLDL. And the reason I mention that is because chylomicron remnants, even though they've given up a lot of their goodies, let's say, so they've given up a lot of their triglycerides as free fatty acids, and they may give up a little bit of these, they're still going to have some stuff there, and the body doesn't want to waste it. So, whenever those chylomicron remnants return to the liver, they interact with remnant receptors, they're endocytosed, and repackaged into a new type of lipoprotein called a VLDL. And a VLDL stands for very low-density lipoproteins. Now, let's talk about the VLDLs. So here's our VLDL. Um, you can see here that it contains a slightly higher percentage of cholesterol and lower percentage of triglycerides. So now when we compare this to the chylomicron, the very low density lipoprotein is going to contain a lot less triglycerides, only 52% of it. But if we look at the combined cholesterol, it's actually going to be about 21%. Seven in the free cholesterol, non-esterified form, and then 14% as a cholesterol ester. Okay? Of course, it's also going to contain phospholipids. Okay. So what is the function of the very low density lipoprotein? Well, its function is going to be similar to that of the chylomicron in the sense that it's going to deliver free fatty acids to peripheral tissues. Okay. So the VLDL is going to be released by the liver and it's going to also contain the enzyme lipoprotein lipase. So when it interacts with a cell type that might want free fatty acids such as adipose tissue or skeletal muscle, then those Peripheral tissues are going to activate that lipoprotein lipase, which is going to split off free fatty acids from the triglycerides that are present in the VLDL. And in doing so, those tissues are going to receive those free fatty acids and they can do whatever they want with them. Again, skeletal muscle might want to metabolize those for energy production. Okay? And that's basically what VLDLs do. Now, now remember, when chylomicrons got rid of their free fatty acids or triglycerides, however you want to look at it, they became chylomicron remnants. When VLDLs get rid of their free fatty acids or triglycerides, they instead become something called IDL. Now we don't have IDL up here because its function is not really uh, super important uh, for understanding how this works. IDL stands for intermediate density lipoprotein. If we look here, we can see that it actually has a significantly lower percentage of triglycerides. That's because the very low density lipoprotein just got rid of those triglycerides by splitting off the free fatty acids. 
and we see that the cholesterol composition actually increases. This is not because it gained more cholesterol. This is a percentage. Okay? The reason the cholesterol percentage went up is because the triglyceride percentage went down. Okay? So that's all that happened. VLDL gets rid of free fatty acids, and it essentially becomes an IDL, an intermediate density lipoprotein. Okay? Now, Intermediate density lipoprotein does no good by itself. It will essentially return to the liver and interact with another enzyme called hepatic lipase. And what hepatic lipase does is it converts IDL into LDL, low density lipoprotein. Okay? Now, low density lipoprotein, notice, actually has a lot less triglyceride percentage than the intermediate density lipoprotein. So it goes down even further from 38 down to 10%. And again, as we would expect, if we're getting rid of some of the triglycerides by percent, we're going to, by default, increase the percentage of cholesterol. So notice now, when we look at a low-density lipoprotein, we now have a situation where the cholesterol percentage is now higher than the triglyceride percentage. And that's going to play a role in low-density lipoprotein's function, which is going to be cholesterol delivery. Now, we're going to cover LDL and HDL in a separate video. It's actually the next video in this playlist, so join us then. But before we conclude this video, I want to emphasize one very important thing about LDL. Notice that LDL is not directly released by the liver. Okay? Whenever you have the liver needing to deliver cholesterol to the body, it does not simply just release LDL. Okay? It has to first release VLDL, then the VLDL has to be converted to IDL, and then finally, when IDL returns to the liver, it will be converted back to LDL, low-density lipoprotein. So the liver does not directly release LDL. It comes from uh, two successive precursors, and the liver directly releases VLDL. Okay? So in the next video, we're going to discuss low-density lipoprotein and HDL, which is high-density lipoprotein. All right, so make sure to join us then. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.